praise. Praise him like you mean it. Amen. Often when we talk about the history of slavery in America, we focus uh, on the treatment of black men and how they were whipped, beaten, disfigured, abused, humiliated, and even killed. Black men were forced to work long hours from sun up to sundown. African black men were very proud of their heritage. However, they were stripped of their dignity, they were stripped of their heritage, they were stripped of their identity, and they were stripped of their faith. Black men were constantly dishonored by whites for the purpose of treating them as less than human. However, as, ba as bad as black men were treated, you can make a strong argument that black women were treated even worse. How do we know that? We have first hands of counts of that. Many slaves, once freed, would write about their experiences, which were called slave journals or diaries. A black woman named Harriet Jacobs, who was born into slavery in North Carolina and was a first-hand eyewitness of what it was like for a black woman during the time of slavery. Harriet Jacobs was born in 1813 and died in 1897. She worked under various white slave owners, but was ultimately able to free herself from slavery and went on to become an abolitionist as well as a writer. As a writer, Harriet centered her work on appealing to white women and northern abolitionists, hoping to expose the horrors of slavery from a non-white perspective. Harriet Jacobs wrote about systemic racism in her book entitled Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. She was the first black woman to write a slave narrative in 1861. By the way, you can still purchase that book, which I did. Amen? Initially, the book was ascribed to uh, Lydia Maria Child, a white abolitionist. It was only 30 years ago when research showed that the book was actually written by a female slave. In Harris Jacobs' first-hand account, during slavery, the black African woman was regarded as an object of economic value. At the same time, black women slaves uh, were also treated as an object of sexual abuse by white slave owners. There was a belief by white slave, uh, whites at that time that a black woman was sexually immoral and loose, and she could be raped and abused at the slave master's will, which many black women had to endure repeatedly. Harriet's book provides insight and depth into the sexual exploitation of black women endured during slavery. She noted the brutalization of black girls and women by white slave masters who justified their cruelty by viewing black women as sexual savages. Many white women hated black women because their husbands found black women sexually desirable. Black women were continuously stripped, beaten, raped, and forced to breed more children to keep the slave system going. As a result, black women suffered a double burden of slavery because of their sexual vulnerability. A black slave was the property of their white slave owner and could be treated any way that pleased the owner. Not only did black female slaves have to endure the abuse and rape from their white owners, they also had to deal with the abuse from their slave owner's wives, who blamed the black woman for what her husband did, for which the black woman had no control over her own body. Colonial laws regula uh, regulating rape were not applied to black people. This meant that blacks could not defend themselves against any forms of abuse by white males. If a black woman accused her master of rape, she was subject, subjugated to more beatings by the master or the master's wife. Also, many of the slaves on the plantation were allowed to marry and have families. However, this does not stop white slave owners from raping married female slaves as well as their daughters, and there was nothing that a black male slave could do about his master forcing himself on his wife or daughters. Another evil thing that, that some white slave owners would do is that they would take their healthy black male slaves and fertile black female slaves and order them to engage in sexual relations for the purpose of getting the black woman pregnant, whether or not she wanted those advances or not. Her body was not hers. The decisions she made were not hers. It was all under control of white slave owners. Amen? 
Of course, it did not matter to the slave owner if these slaves were married to other slaves. This was another way that the plantation owners could increase their population of his slaves. It was actually cheaper to breed slaves than purchase them from a slave auction. This method became even more popular when the U.S. government outlawed the triangle slave trade, which brought over 12 and a half million slaves to North, South, and Central America. To make things even worse for female slaves was that white slave owners would have sex with them on a regular basis, whether they were adults or teenagers. One of the most famous cases was Thomas Jefferson, our third president in the United States, who fathered children with his female slave, Sally Hemings. She was only 14 years old when her sexual relationship with Jefferson began, and he was in his 50s. Could you imagine? Sally Hemings had a total of, of about six children from Thomas Jefferson. This was just how things were with slavery in America. Black women had no rights because they were property as well as sex slaves. However, not only did black women have to fend off the slave owners, they also had to fend off their slave owner's sons, the white plantation workers, and, and yes, even black male slaves. As long as female slaves were producing more slave children, slave owners didn't really care who the father was because they only cared about increasing their profits. Making black women on a plantation the most abused and mistreated per people in America at that time, especially in the South. The death rate among slaves was high. To replace their losses, plantation owners encouraged the slaves to have children. Childbearing started around the age of 13, and by 20, the woman's slaves would be expected to have four or five children. Again, by the age 20. To encourage childbearing, some slave owners promised women slaves their freedom after they had produced 15 children. Go figure. When black women arrived to be auctioned, her kids were often taken from her and sold separately, as well as her husband, if they were all captured together. And even when black women had kids on the plantation, these kids were often taken and sold as well. So black women were often forced to have children, and even those children could be taken and sold for profit. This goes on to show how black women were not respected or treated with dignity for, from the beginning of their life in America. However, the struggles of black women in America did not end because slavery ended, even today. Black women are still mistreated in American society. Amen? Today I want to talk to you from the subject, continue this series on race, racism in the Bible. Uh, this is the subject, when your skin becomes the problem. Amen? When your skin becomes the problem. God, when God created the human race, he created a diversity of people. Amen? Amen. From different shades and different ethnicities. But all people that God created were created in his image and his likeness. Amen? Amen? Just because some are a little lighter or a little darker than the others, it does not mean that they're better. It does not mean that they're more valued. It does not mean that they're more important. Amen? Amen. But in our society, we have constantly used people's skin color against them. Not only do whites do that against blacks, but blacks do that among themselves. Amen? Amen? If you are a darker skin, you're treated still today in a bad way in many places. Amen. And even within the black family, lighter skinned blacks often seen in some circles a little better, even a little smarter, even a little more desirable. And even within the own black community, the black community has fallen for the same thing that, 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 that uh, blacks had to endure during the time of slavery. Because we treat each other with, them, with the same tropes and the same uh, degradations and everything else that was, has been done. But again, I will submit to you today that no one has been treated worse on American soil by far than black women. Amen? Black men didn't have to endure are worried about being raped on a daily basis. But black women, from the time they showed up, by the time that you, you, you were captured, 
I tried, I tried to paint this picture for you again today, for those who are tuning in who have not been listening to this series. When you were captured, you were stripped, you would placed on a ship. On that ship, you were handcuffed. It doesn't matter where you handcuffed to a man or a woman or a child, you were still handcuffed. And you took that voyage while you were naked. And while on that voyage, if you had to use a restroom, you just used it on yourself. Disease was paramount at that time. And many of the slaves did not endure that travel from the continent of Africa to the shores of America. In fact, out of the 12 and a half million brought, brought a million of them died along the journey. This journey could take up to two to four months for you to get from the continent of Africa by the time you got to where you were sold. When you got off that ship, again, remember, remember you're still naked. It doesn't matter the time of the year it was. It doesn't matter whether it was summer, winter, or fall. When you stood there to be auctioned, you stood there in your birthday suit. And the white men would poke and prod the, white, the black women. They would caress their breasts and their buttocks. They would do all sorts of amount of things what today we would call sexual harassment. But in those days, there was no such thing when it came to how a black woman was treated. Again, when she showed up, and if she was captured with her children or husband, she could be sold separately. Because what white slave owners wanted from men was different from what they wanted from children and what they wanted from women. Amen? Amen. And many of these women had to endure always having to be, have someone forced upon them, and they had no rights. Zero. So any time that the white slave owner wanted to have sex with any of his female slaves, who going to tell him no? He did as he pleased. Amen? And so, if you turn to Numbers chapter 12, a very familiar story, but it's probably a story that's overlooked a lot because most Christian people don't read the book of Numbers anyway. Amen? It's one of those forgotten books in the Bible. A little bit of background on the book of Numbers is it takes its English name from the Septuagint, which is called arithmetic, which is, which we get our English word arithmetic. All right? This is another one. The books of the Bible, Old Testament, do not have Hebrew names, uh, Hebrew titles, because the Septuagint, the Greek, the Greek translation of Scripture, because at that time they did not have headings. So all your Old Testament headings are actually Greek names, all right? And so that's where the name Numbers come from. The reason for this, uh, the book uh, containing that name uh, of Numbers was many statistics such as tribal population figures, the total of the priests and Levites, and numerical data. The purpose of the book of Numbers is, to, is the instruction manual to post-Sinai Israel. The manual deals with three areas, how the nation was to order itself in its journey in and around in the, in the promised land, how the priests and Levites were to function in the condition of mobility which lay ahead, and how they were to prepare themselves uh, for the conquest of Canaan and settle their lives there in the land. The fact that the book covers the nearly 40-year period from the beginning of the law at Sinai to the eye of the conquest points to its character as a story in history. But it's more than a recording of history. It is a history with the uh, purpose of describing the Lord's expectations and Israel's reactions in a unique period, an era when the nation had God's promise of the land but had not yet experienced its fulfillment. In other words, the whole time, the book of Numbers is about a promise. Amen? And they're heading toward the promised land. All right? So once again, when your skin becomes the problem. So what can we learn from, from Aaron and Miriam about their sinful actions against Moses? The three main 
characters in this text. Of course, it's Moses and Aaron and Miriam. You understand that Moses is the younger of the three. All right? Miriam and Aaron are the older. All right? And so you understand each of these individuals were given a role in, in, in how God operated among the Israelites. All of them had a position, a responsibility. All right? We know what Moses' role was. His role was to shepherd and lead these two million plus people from Mount Sinai into the promised land. That was Moses' responsibility. Aaron's responsibility because he was chosen as the first high priest. In fact, the Aaron's descendant began the, 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 the lineage of the priesthood. Miriam's responsibility, she was a prophetess, all right? She, she did not sit in the office of prophet because that did not happen until Samuel, all right? There's a difference between being in the office of responsibility and having a prophetic gift. What she had was a gift, not the office, all right? Now, you got to understand this point about this scripture so you can put it in context. Moses was in the office. Aaron was in the office, but not Miriam. She had a gift of responsibility. A responsibility of a prophet, whether female, male or female at that time, they didn't shepherd people. Their responsibility wasn't hold to hold Bible studies. Their responsibility wasn't to preach sermons. Their responsibility was whatever God told them to tell the people, they were supposed to tell them. Amen? Whether God sent the people to them, or sent them in their direction. Amen? And so verse 1 says, Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married. Well, the first point that answers this question is this. What can we learn from Aaron and Miriam about their sinful actions against Moses? The first thing we learn from the very first verse is jealousy can lead to racism. Jealousy can lead to racism. How do we know that? The text tells us that. It said then Miriam and Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. The, 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 they spoke against him. What that means is they challenged his authority. In other words, who are you to think you the boss of me? All right. An example of that is when you tell your kids to do something. And they look at you and say, how dare you? I'm not cleaning anybody's room. I'm not sweeping anybody's floor. And by the way, I'm not doing what you say. All right? That would be the equivalence of that. Because when God, when God puts people in certain roles and responsibilities and positions, it's up to us whether or not we're going to follow through and follow the authority which he, God set up. Amen? Amen? And the role that he had set up at this time, Moses was the chief leader. He was the main leader of God's people. Aaron and Miriam played a role of leadership, but they did not, their role did not succeed, uh, succeed his role or supersede his role. Amen. You got to get this because you got to understand what they're arguing against because this is straight up jealousy. I mean, here are their younger brother. It's more honorable, more respected, and had more responsibility and, than they did. And their attitude is, who you think you are? Don't you know we older than you? Don't you know we got here first? And sometimes people will even argue, I was saved before you were. Well, in God's scheme of things, it doesn't matter. Because God chooses the roles and responsibilities in the family, in the church, and in community. Amen? And when those responsibilities get mixed up, then you got chaos, which is what you got in the church, and what you got in the world, what you got in government, you got in all areas of society, because we don't follow God's order and structure for human authority. Amen? But watch this. They spoke against Moses because of the race of his wife. 
because she was a Cushite woman. Now, what's interesting here is that nowhere in Scripture does it say that, that Moses married or divorced or that Zipporah had died. So more than likely, this is Zipporah. Amen? The only wife that's recorded in Scripture that he actually had. The mother of his children. This is that woman, but she's not referred to by her name because her name in here is not important. Her race is what's important. Amen? Amen. Because they were jealous of him, they decided to do some name calling against who he's married to. Ever been there before? Basically, what's going on is that Moses is involved in an inter interracial relationship. This is an interracial marriage, is what this is. Amen? After Israel had settled down in, in Hazaroth, Miriam and Aaron, Moses' elder siblings, began to challenge his authority, apparently because he had married a Cushite woman. Now, you have to also understand something. Miriam is the one who's pushing this. Aaron is doing what he normally do, comes along. <laughs> there are times in scripture where Aaron doesn't show good quality of character, does he? Because that same Aaron, when Moses was up in the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, getting the commandments of God, which we refer to as the Ten Commandments, and he's gone so long, the people say, we don't know what happened to that fella. And somehow, some way, they encourage Aaron to build them a golden calf. That is the same Aaron. The same Aaron. Now he allows his sister to get involved in this situation. To speak against the one that they should have been afraid to speak against. Let me help y'all out today. Leave people alone that's been handpicked by God. And they're doing God's will. When you speak against them, you're speaking against God. And then God's going to deal with you for speaking against his servant. Amen. If you want to fool with people, go fool with the people who are not saved. And maybe God will give you some grace then. But when it comes to the people of God that's been called by God and doing God's will, just because you disagree with them doesn't give you a right to challenge them. The best thing you can do is pray for them. It doesn't mean you can't speak to them. But when you do it, make sure you do it respectfully because you're speaking against the office that God placed them in. If they're doing something wrong, then God is going to take care of them for what they're doing. Amen? Amen. Whether the pastor, preacher, minister, deacon, doesn't matter. God will take care of them. Again, it doesn't mean that you can't talk to them. But make sure you do the same thing you do when a child sees their parent does something wrong. When that child doesn't talk to the parent like they're talking to their best friend because they caught them doing something wrong. When you have to tell someone there's an authority over you that they've done something wrong, what you do it with is you do it with tact and respect and with dignity. Amen? Because the moment you step out of line, and you make it personal, like they did. But here's the thing. Moses hadn't done anything wrong. Moses was doing the same thing God had called him to do. Leading two plus million mumbling, stumbling, complaining people. Could you imagine having that job? And they should have been supported because this is family. This is this not somebody married into the family. This blood. He's getting this from his own siblings. Of them challenging his authority. This challenge came either because he had married the woman and therefore in their eyes destroyed his credibility or because they were uh, disillusioned with his leadership for other reasons and used the marriage as an excuse. Either way, it was because of Zipporah's race being Cushite Cushite means Ethiopian, if you all didn't know that. Ethiopian has always meant black skin. Don't get it twisted. 
He married a black woman. He loved that black woman. He treated that black woman with respect and dignity. That was the mother of his children that he loved. Oh, but the brother and sister had a problem with it. They had a problem with it. People today still have a problem with who people marry, especially when they marry somebody that don't look like them. So there's some lessons in this text today for all those who got issues against that. If you're in that situation, just tell your family members, take it up with God. Take it up with God. Amen? This means that the, that the woman, Zipporah, that this Jewish forefather married was from African descent. She was a descendant of Noah's son, Ham, through Cush, which came the Cushites. All right? You can trace the lineage. That's easy. You just turn, open the Bible and look at the lineage. Miriam and Aaron were jealous of Moses' special relationship with God as well as his position of authority. So they attacked Moses' Cushite wife, who was black. Now notice that Moses' wife had nothing to do with this. This was between them. But she gets brought into the situation all because of a race. In other words, when your race becomes the problem. Her race was only a part of the problem because they made it part of the problem. Because she was minding her own business. Being the wife that she should be. Being respectful as she should and allowing her husband to lead. It's not Zipporah's responsibility uh, that, that she's not staying in her lane. The problem is, is that Aaron and Miriam are not staying in theirs. And the problem in society that you have is when people don't know how to stay in their lane. It starts in the family. The man was created by God to be the spiritual head of the home. But the problem is that, that, that same leadership structure that God didn't intend just for the home, he intended for it to be the foundation of society. Amen? Amen? Because how can he be the spiritual head of the home, but that flips when you get out in society? How can that flip when you get to the church? Remember, we talked about the three institutions or uh, covenants that God made in Scripture. He created the family, he created the church, and he created the government. Amen? Amen? But the problem is, broken men are leading the family. Broken men, uh, broken men are leading the government. And broken men are leading the church. That's what's wrong with us today. Men who are not living according to the will and standards of God are leading the three covenants that God created. So you see why our society is in the mess that it's in? Because there used to be a time that we wanted our fathers to have, be, be respectful and be someone in dignity in the community, someone would be honorable. Isn't that how we used to want to view fathers? Isn't that how we want to view men at the church? That men would be men of honor, respect, and dignity, that our leaders, our pastors, our deacons, our ministers, our elders, that, that would be men of honor and integrity? Isn't that what we would hope to have sitting in the seat of our government? Men of integrity? Men who show that they know how to respect women? Men who show that they know how to respect other people? We are so backwards in this country, we accept anybody that gets up there to lead. And we blindly follow whether it's the family, whether it's the church, or whether it's the government. We blindly follow. All they got to do is be charismatic enough. It doesn't matter if they're not living their life right. We don't care. We don't care if our pastors are immoral today. We don't care if our fathers or uh, uh, husbands are immoral today. We don't care. Because women will say, I'd rather have my little bit of husband, and no, as bad as he is, he's still mine, than have none. Something wrong with that picture. 
If you don't make people hold themselves accountable, when are they ever going to hold themselves accountable? If you keep allowing what they're throwing at you and what they're putting up with, then, then, then why is it that we blame them when we should be blaming ourselves because we're the one who put them there? Amen? The second thing we learn from this text, after we learn that the number one uh, what can we learn from Aaron and Miriam about their sinful actions against Moses is jealousy can lead to racism. The second thing we learn from this, check, uh, this text is racism leads to sin. Look at verse 2. And they said, this is Miriam and Aaron speaking. Miriam's name is mentioned first because she's the one taking the lead. Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has, not, has he had not spoken through us as well? And watch this, and the Lord heard it. See, when they're going against Moses, they're not going against Moses alone. Because Moses did not appoint himself to lead Israel. God did. Moses is not the one who called him and put him in ministry. But when, there's, when you speak against that, then you're speaking against God himself. And because of that, God had to take action because God's name is being challenged. God's authority is being challenged because the only authority that exists is the authority which God gives out. God has his authority where he controls everything, but for the sake of running things on this earth, God has empowered certain men in order to lead in, in, in different functions, in order to keep, keep st uh, stability in society. When that is broken, the reason why racism spreads in the United States, because those three institutions are broken. The reason why slavery was able to exist and last as long as it did in the United States is because that system was broken. Because many of the slave, slave owners actually, on Sundays, sat their slaves around with their family and read the Bible to them. Did you know that? But they didn't read the whole counsel of God. They just read passages to keep certain passages to keep slaves in their place. Amen? We're going to talk about that later, not today. Because you can take the Bible out of context. To, to, to cause it, to try to get it to say anything you want to say about it or get it to say anything. And the problem with us today is we sit in churches under pastors who don't even know the Bible. But we don't care. We don't care. All we care about is the choir is good. All we care about is they've got nice facilities. And they got a lot of people coming. That's all we care about. We don't care if the people speaking to us and preaching to us don't know the Bible or know about that much of the Bible. And all they do is recycle what they say every Sunday in a different package. And you've been there for years, but you never went through the whole Bible or even attempted to go through the whole Bible. You can't go through and teach what you don't know as well as you don't go through and teach what, what is not your preference. Because if your preference is to keep people in bondage and keep them coming, then you might just want to tell them what you want them to know. Which is the same thing that slave owners did. Because they were telling the slaves, it was God's divine will that you in your situation. And we didn't make you. God is the one made you less than us. Could you imagine hearing that every day? And the problem is that Many blacks still act that way. And that's, what, that's the saddest thing about all of this. The Bible says th those whom the Son is set free are free indeed. But in Galatians 5.1 it said uh, that we're not to uh, allow our freedom. It's for freedom that Christ set us free, it says. So therefore, don't put yourself back in bondage. Once you're free, live free. Amen. But too many of us still live in bondage. Verse 2 says, and they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only to Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? Because again, racism leads to sin. And what I would submit to you, racism is sin. And the Lord heard it, 
They were jealous of Moses, their younger brother. Both Miriam and Aaron had significant roles. Again, Aaron is a high priest. Miriam is a prophetess. As Moses owed the siblings, Miriam and Aaron may assume they should, have, they should hold equal authority, failing to recognize God's choice of Moses as his representative. It's sad to say, but we lost members of this church because people wanted the same role of authority that God has given me as pastor of this church. And they left because of that. I'm not the pastor of Agape, and I have not been here for this uh, almost 18 years in this role because I put myself in this role. I would just tell you honestly, most of us who were called to be pastors, we ran from that. We didn't want that responsibility because we know the heartache and headache that comes along with the responsibility, but we do it because guess what God called us to do? And even after all of the disappointments and headaches and setbacks, the thing that we're most proud of as pastors is being able to speak life into your life. Amen. Amen. To be able to speak God's word into your life where your life changes. Because I will submit to you that from the time you start coming to Agape or listen to Agape, your life should not be the same. Because you should have drawn a little closer to God. And that's the reason why we take the time to sit and go through the scripture with you. Instead of springboarding off the scripture and talk about whatever we want to talk about. People didn't know that the Bible had this much to say about racism. Until we start going through the text. But not only showing you where it was, but showing you how it applies. So we can learn from it and do better. Amen? Here's the key verse in, ver in point in verse 2. Has he not spoken through us also? This question was meant to lift Miriam and Aaron up. After all, God speaks also to us. So shouldn't we get some of the credit, ar credit around here? Of course God has spoken to Miriam and Aaron in the past, but he had not given them the authority to lead the nation. That was not their role. Their role was to support Moses. That's what their role was. Their ministry was given to them to support the ministry that God had given Moses. Let me help some of y'all out who attend church. The ministry that you've been given, the reason why you're in the church that you're in, if you're in the right place, your ministry does not supplant your pastor's ministry. It upheld that ministry. It undergirds that ministry if you're in the right place. Amen. It's when you, when you hear from a minister who didn't get it, but became a senior pastor, but gets it after they had that, that role. Amen? See, see, some of us, until we go through something, we can't understand what somebody else went through. Amen? Somebody can tell you about it. If you've never been robbed before at gunpoint, then you, you, you don't know what that experience feels like. Even though you've seen it probably a few times on TV. But if it happens to you, it's a unique experience that you will never, ever forget. Never, ever forget. It's one thing to face racism because your life ain't going anywhere. It's a whole other thing to face racism and you've been doing everything you can to play by the rules. And you still face racism. You still face sexism. You still being treated only because of your skin color and only because you're a woman. If you haven't learned by now, the way that society runs, especially when society is dominated by men, and especially in the United States when it's still dominated by a certain group of men, which is white men, who make the decisions for everybody else. And of course, if you're a low man, a low woman on the totem pole, as they see it, and of course you're going to be marginalized. Of course you're going to be disparaged. Of course you're going to be mistreated. Because they're not going to look at you as a person. They still look at you as a sex object. Let me help out black men today. We better start speaking up for our sisters. Amen? Because how can you complain about somebody else don't look like y'all that's going to be putting your wife down and you put her down anyway? You don't have a room to talk. All right, all right. 
You don't show any respect. So why are you mad when somebody else disrespects her? When you set the tone. When you sowed the seed. Amen? Just because you're proud of your heritage doesn't mean you believe your heritage is better than anybody else. You're just proud of who God made you. And we all should be proud of the package and family in which God birthed us into. Amen? And stop downplaying that. Stop telling people I don't see color. That's ridiculous. If you don't see color when you went by your car, did you choose a color? I'm sure you did. You didn't walk in there and say, give me a car with no color. Amen. Amen. Here's the thing about sin. That is, rele that is relevant to this, this, this passage is, as we always say, that sin will always do three things to you. Take you further than you're willing to go, keep you longer than you want to be kept, and cost you more than willing to pay. Again, take you further than you're willing to go. See, all they want to do is have some little chatter against their brother. They didn't want God to hear it. But what they fail to realize is God hears everything, especially when it involves his people. Amen? See, this situation kept them longer than they wanted to be kept because, again, they didn't realize that they weren't speaking against Moses himself. They were challenging God's authority. And, again, it cost them more than they were willing to pay. The third thing that we learn from this text is, is what we learn from Aaron and Miriam's, Miriam's mistake is sin gets God's attention. All right? Number one, again, jealousy can lead to racism. Number two, racism leads to sin. And number three, sin always gets God's attention. Because it says in verse two, and the Lord heard it. Of course God heard it. God always does. And he hears according to truth, not according to mere appearance. Miriam and Aaron is often the case where accusing Moses of the very same sin motivation that motivated them to make the accusation, which was pride. See, they were accusing him of being prideful. When they the one were being prideful. Amen? Amen. Numbers chapter 32, verse 23 says, your sin will find you out. Amen? You always want to... Uh, want to get God's attention for doing what's right. But never do you want to get God's attention because you're doing something wrong. Verse 3 says, now, what's inserted here is verse 3 is inserted. Because of the fact, now, God came down in a pillar of cloud, which is symbols of God's glory in his manifest presence. So he came down and met them at the tent of meeting. When he called all three of them on the carpet, Moses just stood there and listened. And then he said, y'all two, come in. I don't know about you, but I, I've been there before when I've been called on the carpet. I've been there when I was growing up, being called on the carpet by my parents because I did something wrong. I, I had to go explain myself. I, in other words, there was some explaining need to be done. <laughs> but no matter how much explaining was done, the right hand of fellowship was still coming. Amen. Amen. And I remember being in the military. And have to go and see my commanding officer, my commander. In the military, when you're told to go see your commanding officer, that is a legal command. So when you go see the commanding officer, then what you have to do, you have to go and you have to give a reporting statement. So I would, I would walk up there and I would stop and I would say, uh, sir, Emory Powell reports his order. And I dropped my salute. And hopefully it was something that I did that was good that he wanted to bring to my attention. And if it's not, it was something bad that he wanted to bring to my attention. And then I had to salute again and about face and leave his office. Amen? That's what it meant being called on the carpet. But it's in this case, they've been called on the carpet by God because they did something that offended God. See, Moses, he told all three of them to, to uh, make themselves available, show themselves. But when they got there, they, he said, y'all two come in. <laughs> you and you, Mary and Adam, come in. Now, they, had, they knew they were in trouble. 
And they knew they were in more trouble than Moses was. He says, now, verse 3 says, now, the, the man Moses was very humble more than any man who was on the face of the earth. That's how God saw Moses. But they didn't see their brother that way. They should have. Because the problem is they were looking at their brother through the lenses of pride instead of live, looking at him through the lenses of scripture. You always get it wrong when you look at people as some other way other than looking at them through scripture. If you look at them the way you see them and your way is flawed, then you're not going to see them the way God sees them. Amen? The fourth thing we learn from this text is that the wrong kind of attention would God get you in trouble. Look at verse 4. It says, suddenly uh, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and to Miriam, you three come out here to the tent of meeting. So the three of them came out. At that point, the Lord himself intervened and took up the defense of his certain mode. See, here's the thing what you got to learn. It's not up to you to fight your battles. That's God's job. Amen? It doesn't mean you can't speak your peace, but you got to know how far to take that. It doesn't mean you can't defend yourself, but you got to know how far to take that. And at some point when you realize you're dealing with a fool or people acting foolishly or sinfully, then sometimes you just got to step back and pray and let God intervene. Amen? And this is what Moses did. Moses just let out. Moses didn't try to defend himself. Nowhere in there did Moses start name calling them because they called him something that, that, that they didn't agree with or was something they believed about him. But he didn't defend himself. He didn't need to because he knew God was on his side. Amen? What happens to Miriam, here's what's happened. Moses' wife, just like her husband, embraced faith in one true God. This is what's not talked about a lot of times. Zipporah was, was a powerful woman of God. Zipporah, when you read about Zipporah, do you ever read about anything bad about Zipporah? Didn't she say Moses? Remember, she knew the covenant, eight days, circumcision. He failed to do that. God was going to kill Moses. She intervened on her husband's behalf in that situation. Amen? What they didn't recognize before they talked down to her because of her race is that what they should have saw, her Christian character. They should have saw that she was the right woman to be married to the right man. Amen. And the main thing is she knew how to stay in her lane, which a lot of women don't know how to do. Don't know how to stay in their lane. I realize that a lot of black women are angry. And I realize why they're angry. They should be angry at us. We deserve it. But don't let your anger against your man cause you to step out of line and get out of your lane as God has called you to be. Amen? You often hear people say that my mother was my mother and my father. Well, that's a biblical impossibility. I understand what you're trying to say, though. But that's a biblical impossibility. If it just so happened you're a single woman raising your kids, then stay in your lane. And where the, the, that spot is missing, where that husband is supposed to be, then don't try to put somebody there that shouldn't be there. And definitely don't do this. Step over and straddle both uh, positions. Because then you out of order. What you do is stay in your lane. Be the best wife you could possibly Not be trying to be a husband. Not be trying to be a father, which you are not equipped to do. But be the woman God created you to be and let the Holy Spirit, let God himself and the person of Jesus Christ to step in to be the father in your house. Amen. And even if your husband is in the house, but refuses to be the father, the godly father of the house, you still stay in your lane. And still let God come in and be the father in that house. Amen. Here's the thing about marriage. Marriage is faith based, not race based. In God's eyes, marriage has nothing to do with your race. Because Contrary to popular belief, God doesn't have a problem with black people marrying white people. Because they're both human to him. We just got a problem with it. Amen? We got a problem with it. The Lord came down and the Lord called them. Now, second question. How did God respond to Aaron and Miriam because of their sinful actions? Number one, he came down. When you hear this in scripture, oftentimes this doesn't mean a good thing. 
I'll give you another example. Remember Genesis 6? You remember when the Bible talks about what happened and, and, and mankind and the whole sinful race was falling apart? Also remember in Genesis 11 when you had the Tower of Babel? And it said God came down to get a closer look. You do understand that God can look from heaven. But when you hear the language when, he's, when, it's, when it sounds like he said I'm coming a little closer, then you know you're in trouble. Because it said he came down, verse 5. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood in the doorway of the tent. Now this is anthropomorphic term, terminology. In other words, it's using human-like qualities to describe a holy God. So you and I, puny minds, can understand. Amen? It's, it's what's referred to theologians call anthropomorphic terms. In other words, use human-like qualities, human-like emotions to describe God. And this is one of those, uh, those situations. So the first thing he did, he came down. The second thing he did, he called them on the carpet. Verse 5, the second half of verse 5 says, And he called Aaron and Miriam when they had come be both before him. The third thing we, we learned is that he chastised them, he chastised them for their actions. He said, verse 6, Hear now my words, if there is a prophet among you, I the Lord shall make myself known to him in a vision. I shall speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in my whole household. In all my household, it says, with him I speak mouth to mouth. In other words, some translations say face to face. Even openly, not in dark sayings, and in, in beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant, against Moses? Why did you not see the anointing I put on him? Why did you not revere the presence you saw of me in him? But even though you saw all of that, you still spoke against that. But here's the thing, Mir and Aaron, you weren't speaking against him because he has no authority, only what I gave him. Because it was my authority you were speaking against in him, you were actually speaking against me. And because you were speaking against me, now I got to take action against you. You understand it now? This is because Moses and Moses was faithful in all God's house. Was a, faithful, a reference to Moses' faithful performance of his role as a covenant mediator between God and Israel. See, Moses' responsibility was he was a covenant mediator. That's not the role he gave Miriam. That's not the role he gave Aaron. He only gave the role of a covenant mediator. What you got to understand from this, Moses is a type of Christ. All right? Don't get it twisted. I didn't say he was Christ. His role was a type of Christ. Because the Bible tells us in the New Testament around 1 Timothy 2, 5, there's only one mediator between God and man, and that's the God-man, Jesus Christ. Amen? So in the Old Testament, in this responsibility, God used Moses to fulfill that role of mediator. All right? Verse 9 says, so the anger of the Lord burned against them and he departed. The fourth thing we find about that God did to them was he judged them, which is verse 10. But when the cloud had withdrawn over them, the tent, behold, was leprous, as white as snow, as Aaron turned toward Miriam, behold, she was leprous. Miriam's offense was serious because she had led an insurrection against God's choice, servant, and covenant mediator. And Aaron was just foolish enough to go along. Stop going along with people who are leading you away from God or insurrection against God. Amen? If she had merely suffered the disgrace of being spat on in, it, in, in the face, which the, the previous the following verse says, by her father, she would have been remained outside the camp for seven days. In other words, if a, if a, if a, if a if a daughter's father was so disgusted with her, he would spit in her face. You don't like that today, do you? Nobody does. And if, he, if she had done something so wrong and so against the family and against him, what he would do is he would spit in her face. And when he spit in her face, that means she was unclean, so she had to go outside the family, outside the camp, for seven days in order for purification. In other words, it equates the punishment. Because remember, Aaron is now mediating. Now he's sorry in these following verses. And the Lord expressed his contempt for Miriam's presumption by officiating, uh, I mean, afflicting her with a horrible skin disease. 
And the line with ceremonial law, which required a diseased person to remain outside the camp for seven days, which is Leviticus uh, chapter 13 and 14, which is what Miriam was forced to do. Second Chronicles 16, 9 said, For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. You have acted foolishly in this. Indeed, from now on, you will surely have wars. In other words, that verse is telling us that God sees everything, especially everything involving his children. Nothing we do. I don't care if we do it at night or during the day. I don't care what you're doing. <laughs> I don't know who I'm talking to now. You need to stop doing it. Whatever you're doing is offending God. And ha probably has a lot to do with why you're in the miserable situation you're in is because you sinned against God and, you, and your prideful heart won't allow you to repent. Won't allow you to repent. God is telling you today you need to repent. Amen? But here's the key. Here's what I'm going to close with today. So why did God judge Miriam at this time but not Aaron? Or why did God delay Aaron's judgment? Another way of saying that. Remember, they both did the same thing, even though she was the leader of the insurrection. So the question is, when, when, when God ascended, as soon as he ascended, leprosy fell on her. So my question is, why didn't leprosy fall also on Aaron? Good question. While both Aaron and Miriam both had a... Uh, a, a, a ministerial call. Again, Aaron's the high priest. She is not in the office, but she has a, grif, a gift. A gift. Get that. She is not the prophet. That is not who she is. She has a prophetic gift of prophecy. What you also got to understand by certain prophets, you were considered a prophet or prophetess if God used you one time. Did you understand that? Some people he didn't use over and over again. He just didn't. Search this text. He just didn't. He may have used a person for a particular assignment or a particular period of time, but oftentimes you don't hear about him using them unless they were in the office of prophet like Samuel, which from the time he assumed that role until the time he died. He had that prophetic gift. You got to understand this about uh, the, the gift of an office. And just having a gift, being able to do a certain thing, and maybe sometime during a certain period of time. All right? So Numbers chapter 20 answers this question. Go to verse 23 of chapter 20. Watch this. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron at Mount Hor, by the border of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron, we gather to his people, for he shall not enter the land which I have, I have given to the sons of Israel because you rebelled against my command at the waters of Meribah. All right? By the way, this is the same reason why Moses didn't get in. See, God had already decided back then that Moses and Aaron were not going to go into the promised land. But because God is getting ready to take them in that direction and he has told them that, Mo, that, that Aaron is not going, he's already say, he's saying here Aaron's not going, also saying Moses is not going. So Moses' life ended before they went in. Here's the key. The key thing to understand here is now God no longer needs Aaron. Aaron's ministry is done. His role has been fulfilled. God is through with him. Therefore, watch what happens. It says, take Aaron and his son Eliezer and bring them up to Mount Hor." And strip Aaron of his garments and put them on his son Eliezer. So Aaron will be gathered to his people and he would die there. So Moses did just as God had commanded. And they went up to Mount Hor to the inside of the congregation. And after Moses had stripped Aaron of his garments and put them on Eliezer, Aaron died there on the top of the mountain. Then Moses and Eliezer came down from the mountain. And when all the congregation had, had saw that Aaron had died, all the house of Israel wept Aaron for Aaron 30 days. You didn't just wept for an ordinary person one uh, 30 days. This is often what happened with kings, prophets, high priests, people in special positions that they would mourn for. But did you get the key? Did you get the key? Why did God withhold judgment? 
because he was in the office of priest. And because he's in that office, God decided to withhold judgment on him in this situation. And once the garments came off, which represent the office, he could let him die. This is the same reason why a pastor can live in sin and still survive and still be in that office, even doing, doing all manner of, of things, not preaching the word of God correctly, sinning against people in his church, having affairs, doing all those kind of things, and you wonder why God allows him to get away with that. It's only a matter of time because God's going to strip him from that office. This is what you got to understand, the power of an anointing especially an anointed office. See, they didn't understand it about Moses' anointed office and the significance of that anointed office. So much so, in order to get back him at him, they looked to a black woman that he was married to and decided, let's make fun of her. Or better yet, let's make fun of him because of her. How do you think she felt about that? When she had been the perfect wife, when she had been the perfect servant of God, hadn't done anything but what God told her to do in supporting her husband, stand in her lane, and now she's brought into the conversation because somebody wanted to make her race an issue. Do you realize that some of us are still going through that today? And the reason why you've been single out oftentimes is because somebody has made your race an issue. Amen. And because some people still make race an issue, that's why we still have systemic racism uh, or structural racism, institutional racism, which all mean the same thing in the United States. And the problem is we just don't respect each other. We don't love each other the way the Bible said we're supposed to love each other. Now, here's the sad thing about this. This wasn't Moses' enemies. This wasn't other people in the congregation. This came from Moses' own family. This racism came within his own family, just like racism happens in me and your families. Amen? It's important to understand as we close. It's time to respect our black women. It's time for them to stop being marginalized and mistreated. Do you realize that black women or three to four times likely to be arrested and be incarcerated in a white woman? Do you realize the same percentages that black women are more likely to be in poverty than white women? Oh, y'all don't pay attention to statistics, do you? That's real. And many black women are still trying to prove themselves to this day no matter what they've done. No matter what they've done. So whether you're a black man married to a white woman, or, I mean a, a, a white man married to a black woman, or you're a black man married to a black woman, or a Hispanic man, if you married that black woman, what came with that black, black woman, not just her skin, but her heritage came with her. So stop trying to make her in something that you want her to be. Amen? When your goal is, your God-given responsibility is to help her be what God created her to be, not what you created her to be, what you married her to be, in other words. Amen? So why don't you try and start talking down to her? Why don't you start talking up to her? Why don't you start lifting her up? Because she goes through enough on a job. She goes through enough with raising kids and being grandparents and all that kind of stuff. She goes through enough just doing that. And sometimes all she wants to be respected and hub and, and, and love and not worrying about you. Because you're always out there doing something stupid, got an attitude. <laughs> Amen. It's amazing how women can work one job for 30 years and the guy during the same period, he got about 20 jobs. <laughs> 30 jobs. He got a job every year. Because she will stay even though she's disrespected. She will stay even though she's having a hard time because she's not staying for her. She's staying because I got bills to pay. I got children to help take care of. And I know I can't lean on him because he'll quit his job in any minute. Amen. He, she can't depend on you. Amen. She should be your African queen. She should be the one that you look to and say, boy, you're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. 
You're my queen, and treat her that way instead of treating her like garbage the way the rest of society seems to do as an afterthought. It didn't stop, as we said, when slavery ended. It didn't stop the abuse on a black woman. If you don't believe me, all, they, all Joe Biden did was nominate uh, Kamala Harris, and look what they've been saying about her. If you don't like her policies, that's one thing. Then don't vote for them. But to attack her because of the fact of her heritage being a black woman with Indian descent, as well as uh, what I believe her father was Jamaican descent. The, uh, but here's the thing. That's not called for, is it? No. If you can't respect a United States sitting senator, whether you agree, you agree with the policy or not, to achieve that kind of status in our government, by the way, you know how many black people in the Senate, by the way? Just two. No, actually three. Harris, Cory Booker, Tim Scott. Two, two Democrats and one Republican. Regardless of what you disagree or not, sometimes God allows things to happen to show us our own racism. Sometimes he allows the, us to see things, experience things, to bring things out in us that he already knew was there. One final point, and I'm going to take my seat. You want to know why we have a Donald J. Trump? Because God wanted us to know that, yeah, y'all still racist. And the only way he could show us that when it comes to light is that he had to give us somebody who, who endorses all of that. Now, whether he's that way or not, I don't know. But everything he shows makes people believe that he is. Amen. Because there was a time that, when, that, that uh, white supremacists and night, white nationalists, they would hide their identity. They would wear sheets, not no more. They walk out in public, just like they did in Charlottesville. Doesn't matter. Again, sometimes God allows things to happen to reveal to us that we're not the nation we thought we were. Amen. Amen. And until we decide that we really want to be a Christian nation, then we're going to have to deal with everything God throws it our way. Amen. Amen. Just like COVID-19. Just like all the racial unrest. Just like all the financial instability. I believe that's God's hand. Trying to speak to a nation that's been perpetrating and faking like it's been a Christian all these years. Amen. Because you realize what God did when Jesus walked out there and he saw the fig tree. And the tree, fig tree was profiled and styling and profiled. And the fig tree was like, Bam. All these leaves, no fruit. And, and Jesus cursed the tree because the tree was perpetrating because the tree represented Israel. It's time for the church to stop playing like it's a church. It's time for the body of Christ to stop playing like it's the body of Christ. Because God chooses who he puts in the body of Christ, whether black, white, Asian, Hispanic, or different, it doesn't matter to him. Because God loves diversity because he created diversity. But all of us are one in Christ, those who are us who are actually in Christ. Amen? And the church from now on is going to have to stop being complicit. Amen? The church can no longer be quiet about what's happening that affects the church. Amen? Sometimes you just can't go along because what you're going along with is sin. Amen? When did the, when did the church ever get so transactional? Amen. In other you do this and I do that. No, what we supposed to be doing what God's word says, no matter what. Amen. To our black women, we owe you an apology. And we're deeply sorry for how we haven't treated you and respected you. When the whole world has turned its back on you and we should have been there to stand by your side and to support you for that, we're humbly sorry. And we're eternally grateful that in spite that, you still put up with us. Amen. Beautiful black women. We should be respecting them. Our black daughters, we should be respecting them. Speaking up to them, not talking down to them. Amen. Encouraging them to be the, 
best they can be in Christ, what God created them to be. Amen? Because when you talk to them that way and they become that negativity you've been speaking, well, don't get mad when they become your self-fulfilling prophecy. Amen? When you haven't been encouraging them along the way. When you haven't been there like you should. When you're not teaching your sons to respect women because you don't respect them. Amen? Hopefully today we have a new perspective. Hopefully just walking through scripture that we understand Again, it's not a race thing. In God's eyes, it's a spiritual thing. And all of us will humble ourselves before the throne of grace and be more respectful to not just black women, but to all women. All women, all mothers, all grandmothers deserve our respect. Because where would the church be today if it wasn't for our mothers? Where would they be? I tell you what would be, we'd be in a whole lot of trouble if it had not been for our mothers and our daughters. So we honor you today. Even though this is not Mother's Day, we honor you today. The respect that you deserve, we honor you today for putting up with us, for bearing our children, putting up with our attitudes, putting up with us when we feel like quitting a job and we know the money is not there and it falls on the woman. Now that we know better, can we do better? Can we make a commitment to God that we're going to do better today? That we're going to respect people for who they are? Not because we agree with their policies or whatever, that we just respect them because they too are a child of God or a potential child of God. Amen? Amen. Let us pray together. Eternal God, our Father, we bow before you today. Thank you, O oh God, for this word. Thank you, O oh God, for, for speaking to our hearts, O oh God. Lord, help us to learn from the example of Aaron and Miriam. And even though they were your children, they had been appointed by you in those positions, they still had jealousy in their heart, which led to racism in their heart. Because they did a racist act against their brother, against their sister-in-law Zipporah, Lord, help us to learn from this message today. Help us to respect people regardless of what color they are, what ethnicity, what background they are. Father, we turn to you now and ask for your forgiveness. We ask for forgiveness on behalf of the United States of America. We ask forgiveness on behalf of all the slave owners and all those who were involved in the sense of uh, transatlantic slave trade. We ask for forgiveness for all of those blacks in Africa who played a role in having and selling their fellow Africans into bondage to those white men. Lord, we pray and ask for forgiveness for a country that falls way short in so many ways. Lord, help us, oh God, to finally be a nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice fall is our prayer and we pray all these things in jesus name and all of god's people said amen amen and amen give the lord a hand of praise amen. hallelujah hallelujah hallelujah
say, He knows my race. He knows where I am from. He knows my driver's scheme. And He calls me back. The Father, He calls me His own. He'll never leave me, no matter. He knows my race. He knows where I am from. He sees his grace, the force I need. Say amen again. Amen. What an awesome God we serve. We're just searching the scriptures to see what the Bible has to say about what we're going through with racism in America. And I hope that you have been enlightened and have been blessed, tying in the history as well as the scripture. Pray for me as I write these things down in a book. As I work on these things, hopefully God will allowed to be published is my prayer to all of you who've been tuning in with us those of you who are with us and those who are tuning in uh, around the world we say thank you we thank you for joining us today and having this worship experience with us and if today's message has been a blessing to you I would encourage you uh, to go to our website at agapecommunityfellowship.org and there is a tab there where you can click on and you can also get involved with our midweek Bible study where you can join us on Zoom on Wednesday night. And also, to click on the tab to donate. And we want to encourage you and continue to encourage you to give to this ministry. You can give to our general fund. And we also want to encourage you to give to our African Fellowship Fund that we use to help support uh, our African Nigerian seminary families. We thank God for each of them. Their presence so enrich our ministry here at Agape. And we thank God for each of them. We thank God for each of you. We thank God for our members who aren't able to lay eyes on on a regular basis. But just know that we're praying for you. We thank God for you each and every day. And I pray that you're still praying for us. We pray for all of our pastor friends, all of our Christian friends around the world. And we lift up the name of Jesus. All of us turn to the cross because we realize that at the foot of the cross, all ground is level. Amen. No matter what background, no matter what nationality, what, no matter what ethnicity, at the foot of the cross, the playing field of the ground beneath the cross is level. Amen? Amen. Let us stand receive our benediction. We thank God for each of you today. And we pray that you have a blessed week. May you do all everything that you need to do to stay safe by wearing a mask, especially when you go out in public. And one other thing, make sure that you vote. Make sure you check to make sure 
that your registration is updated so you don't get surprised when you go vote. I will also encourage you that you would go ahead and vote early as you possibly can. Amen? I encourage you to vote. That is your God-given ability that you've been given by everything that people have struggled to go through so that you and I can vote. So let's make them proud by voting in you. Amen? Receive your benediction. May God bless you and keep you. May he always make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. May nothing you face in life be anything you or God cannot handle. May you go forth today knowing that you matter to God. Who you are, your ethnicity matters to God. Because when God made you, he broke the mold because he got it right the first time. You're special in the eyes of God, regardless race, ethnicity, or skin color. God made you, and he didn't make any mistakes. He made you exactly what he needed you to be. And may you turn to him for your provision. May you turn to him every day for your substance. May you turn to him every day for your, prote for your protection. And until we meet again, may God watch between me and you is our prayer. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said amen, amen, and amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. God bless each and every one of you. Have a wonderful week in Jesus' name.